It's my honor to introduce Professor Daniela Zolkman, a journalist, artist, and scholar whose work is as fearless and compelling as it is disciplined. Her photographs challenge us to interrogate power, relationships, and notions of the past. Professor Zolkman teaches photojournalism as part of Tulane's communications department. She is a National Geographic Society grantee, a Pulitzer Center grantee, and a Cashlight Fellow. She is the founder of Women Photograph, an organization that promotes the work of women and non-binary visual artists, which has grown into an essential platform for elevating underrepresented voices in the field. Her photography has been widely published in the New York Times, National Geographic, The Wall Street Journal, Le Monde, and other leading publications. Additionally, Zalkman has earned multiple prestigious awards, including the Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Award and a World Press Photo Award in recognition of her profound impact on the field of documentary photography. At Tulane Libraries, we were particularly drawn to Zalkman's work because it addresses what we as stewards of cultural memory often call collection silences. These silences represent gaps in our collective histories where stories, most often from the marginalized and um, marginalized, have been suppressed or actively erased and ignored. Libraries as institutions that safeguard cultural memory face both a challenge and an opportunity when it comes to these silences. Our collections are not just repositories of books and documents, they are reflections of the voices we choose to amplify and the histories we choose to preserve. Zalkman's work directly speaks to the responsibility of visually restoring moments in history which have been left undocumented, bringing visibility and weight to stories that had been lost within those silences. At Tulane Libraries, we recently acquired two prints from Daniela's collaborations with the artist Dred Scott, which perfectly exemplify this important work. These black and white images depict performers reenacting the German coast uprising of 1811, the largest slave rebellion in US history, a pivotal yet forgotten event. Prior to Scott and Zulkman's work, this rebellion remained faceless in our collective memory with no known visual documentation. Together, they brought the fast into focus, offering us a vision of defiance and hope that had been hidden from view. Dred Scott, a visionary artist known for his powerful, collaboration, powerful explorations of history and social justice, created this reenactment to reclaim a critical moment of resistance. Zolkman's photography immortalizes the event, making visible what had been erased. Her images remind us that history is not just what happened, but how we remember it. Dred Scott, oh, I'm sorry, as Tasia Cole notes, to write or make art is in part to find new ways to be present in the world. This is an important act because being present is difficult. Um, being present and alive in the world, but also being um, present in the world that could be with all its contingencies, injustices, and possibilities is what artists strive for. Zalkman's work echoes this sentiment, offering us a way to confront the world as it is and as it could be through her profound exploration of forgotten histories and silenced voices. Her edited volume, one second, What We See, Women in Non-Binary Perspectives Through the Lens, further exemplifies this effort to broaden and enrich our understanding of the world. The book amplifies underrepresented voices, centering, um, sorry, centering diverse visual narratives that challenge dominant perspectives. It reflects Zulkman's uh, dedication to expanding who gets to tell the stories we see and whose perspectives are brought to the forefront in documenting human experiences. In this, Professor Zulkman and the libraries share goals and values. As the libraries continue to evolve as active participants in shaping cultural memory, Zalkman's work exemplifies how we can address collection silences by actively seeking out and documenting stories which have been ignored. Her photography and her broader view are not just about the past, but a call to action for the present and the future, using visual storytelling to drive liberation and social change. Please join me in welcoming the talented Professor Zalkman to Tulane Libraries today as she shares her approach to photography and a broader view of the visual. Thank you for taking part in this conversation about the power of document, art, and memory in creating a more just future. Hi, friends. Thank you all for coming out. Um, that was such a good and thorough introduction. I feel like I can just click through the photos and I don't need to talk. Like you've <laughs> heard everything you need to hear, right? Um, I'm really excited to be here with all of you. Thank you for, for spending some of your time on this exceptionally beautiful Thursday afternoon in the library. 
Uh, I'm going to talk through a series of different long-term projects that have been sort of pivotal in how I've defined myself as a visual storyteller and in how I've thought about the power of photojournalism. Um, but before I get into those projects, this is how I got my start as a photojournalist. Um, and, you know, I've wanted to be a journalist since I was about 12. I think it's always been something that I felt deeply drawn to. It's always been something that I've wanted to participate in as a career, as a craft. And this isn't necessarily what I had in mind uh, working for New York City tabloids, but you know, for me as a teenager, I needed to get to New York City as soon as I could. I needed to be you know, working for newspapers, and so I was fortunate enough to go to Columbia University. The second I got to campus, I joined the college newspaper, and by the start of my sophomore year, uh, the then president of Iran, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, came to speak at Columbia as part of the World Leaders Forum. Um, this was a highly anticipated and also highly controversial event. So Columbia essentially locked down the campus and wouldn't let outside media in to document. And so the New York Daily News called up the student newspaper office and said, hey, is there anyone there? Is there a student who could photograph this for us? I was mostly a writer at the time. I had started out wanting to be a reporter. I was working on the news desk. I was an associate news editor. But I had just started to pick up a camera because I had taken a few emergency assignments for a friend who was the photo editor of the paper at the time. And I started to kind of slowly fall in love with the immediacy and the vulnerability and the emotion of photojournalism. And so I said, yeah, I, I can take that assignment. Sure, why not? And I uh, went to the event. I photographed it for the Daily News. And it was the front page of the, uh, the paper the next day. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of my colleagues pride themselves for their images being used in UN tribunals and for Senate hearings. This is where this front page ended up uh, <laughs> a few weeks later um, in an SNL short. So not, not quite as noble, um, but you know, we all have to start somewhere. So, um, so for the next five, you know, I uh, took that image when I was 19 and uh, uh, the start of my sophomore year, and I spent the next five years more or less working full time for the Daily News, um, photographing building collapses and crime scenes and fires and running around all of New York City, you know, the, the then mayor uh, of the city, Mike Bloomberg, other people about town who were wandering around New York. Um, you know, my senior year was the start of the 2008 presidential campaign. So I spent uh, the first two weeks of school skipping class. I know I have a couple students in here. Do as I say, not as I do. Thank you. Um, spent a couple weeks skipping class and going to the DNC and the RNC and had also spent the previous summer traveling around to primaries and caucuses and really falling in love with news photography and political photography. I had spent a ton of time working on the, uh, or documenting the campaign of the then junior senator from Illinois uh, as he rose to prominence. Um, as someone who was working in newspapers and had fixated as on newspapers as sort of the place where I wanted my home to be as a journalist, I pretty quickly learned that I had to be a generalist and I had to be able to photograph everything. So even though I am uniquely unqualified to photograph sports or bull riding in Madison Square Garden. That was something that I did. I also photographed celebrities like Katy Perry and Jizza from Wu-Tang Clan. Um, as the only woman under the age of 40 uh, on the Daily News team, I got sent to every single fashion week. Again, probably uniquely unqualified to document fashion as well, but here we are. Um, and so, you know, this is about the first five years of my career, was working for the Daily News and the Wall Street Journal getting to know New York City, getting to know what it meant to be a photojournalist. None of my formal education is in either journalism or photography. I actually have a background, a, a degree in architecture. My mother is a lawyer, my dad is a doctor, as is common, I think, with immigrant and first-generation parents. They told me, you can be a lawyer or a doctor. Those were my choices. Um, and so the architecture degree kind of kept them at bay for a little bit longer while I fully intended to be a journalist. But in these five years, you know, as, as this constituted my education with the Daily News and the Wall Street Journal, I learned not only that, you know, this, I, I learned New York City, I learned how to do this job, I learned how to be really versatile and quick, but I also learned that maybe this wasn't the, the long-term permanent home that I wanted. Because I think in the end, you know, the, the beauty and the kind of curse of a daily newspaper cycle is that it has to come out every 24 hours. And that means that you have to, as a daily newspaper photographer, produce three, five, seven, nine stories every single day. And so I was very often given at most 15 minutes to two hours to work on a given story, to form a deep connection with someone, to try to photograph them in a way that felt honest and vulnerable and open and learn something true about them. 
And then I would throw everything back in my camera bag and get back on the subway and go to the next assignment and do it over again. And doing that multiple times a day, every single day, started to get a little exhausting to me because I loved the work and I loved the mechanics of the work, but most of all, I loved that relationship building. And that was what I wanted to spend more of my time doing. So I'm 24. I don't have any of the street credentials to be sent on like large international assignments. And I can give an entire separate TED talk about the fact that, you know, I think a lot of young early career journalists think that you have to go as far away from home as possible to make meaningful work. Of course, we know that there are so many meaningful stories in our own backyards. And those are the stories we often can and should focus on. But in 2011, South Sudan became a new nation, our, our newest nation. And I thought that seems like an important and major geopolitical event. So a colleague of mine and I decided we were going to save up all of our funds from you know, just constantly working away uh, in the daily newspaper cycle and take a month off and, and try to go to South Sudan and document independence. And as we were trying to figure that out, as just an aside, I, this is uh, the... Uh, this is Robert Mugabe, and I just had this strange thought today that my hard drives are just increasingly becoming filled with ghosts, which is sort of an odd thought. Um, you know, we realized, or I realized in, in preparing for this trip that, you know, no one was going to fund this work. It was probably unlikely that I was going to be able to even sell this work because every single wire photographer was there. But this felt like it was politically important and globally important. And so I wanted to be there to witness it and to participate in telling the story. But on the way to South Sudan, my colleague and I stopped in Uganda because we had to wait to process our visas to get into Juba to South Sudan. And while I was there, I, I had never been to Africa before. I had never been to East Africa before. I start Googling and I just look at what's happening in Uganda. What, what are the major news stories that have just you know, been occurring? And one of the first things I came across was the fact that the first LGBTQ rights activist and essentially the first out gay man in Uganda had been murdered three months prior. So I reached out to the nonprofit that he had founded and the activists who worked for that nonprofit. And I said, hey, I'd, I'd love to do a story on the work that you all are doing. At the time, there was this anti-gay law that was starting to work its way through parliament. It felt like a particularly important moment to document this community. And I kind of expected, again, as someone who was so completely green to this type of relationship building and long-term projects, kind of expected that this community would go, we have no idea who you are, please go away, we don't want to talk to you. But instead, they were incredibly welcoming. And it started about four years of a relationship of me documenting the uh, evolution of this anti-gay law that eventually was passed by parliament. It was signed into law by President Yoweri Museveni. Um, and then it was struck down six months later. Uh, I spent about four years going back and forth to Kampala, documenting this really fierce community of activists and trying to figure out the balance between giving them the visibility that they thought was so important to their movement and also protecting their identities and making sure that I wasn't endangering anyone. There was this really terrible habit that a lot of local Ugandan newspapers had of co-opting images from Western agency, wire agencies and newspapers and then publishing them under horrible headlines that encouraged violence essentially towards queer people. So I became extremely mindful of what my responsibility was both to honor folks who trusted me with their image and wanted to be visible and wanted to be the face of their movement and also ensure that I wasn't going to cause anyone harm because there was a real potential for not just criminalization and folks ending up in jail, but also for you know mass violence and folks being fired and people losing relationships with family. Um, so you know, this was sort of the first time that I started considering what are the other mechanisms and tools that are available to us as visual storytellers. And this is sort of around the time that I started playing with composites and double exposures, because I figured I can still honor the image and the likeness of activists. I can still make sure that they're seen and visible. And also, I don't think that the local Ugandan tabloids are going to steal this image and, and run it under a terrible headline. So this is sort of my first foray into alternative process as a means of storytelling. And it was also the entry point for me to start thinking about my own storytelling as a mechanism for thinking about colonial histories and the ways in which colonial histories impact the present. This 
story and the story of this anti-gay law in Uganda had gotten a fair amount of Western attention. It was seen as being fairly unusual because in many other respects, Uganda was very progressive when it came to a lot of their public policies. And so there was a lot of hand wringing and a lot of stories that were written that sounded like, oh, how, how could Uganda do this? You know, in an era when more than 80 countries were in some way criminalizing sexual minorities. And the truth was at the time in the United States, we still had not legalized marriage equality. And also we know that we continue to have horrific laws enacted state by state that threaten the lives and safety of trans people and queer people. And there was a complete lack of contextualization that I found in the way that a lot of Western press were writing about this history. Most of all, because the introduction of homophobia and the introduction of anti-gay laws actually came from British colonizers in the 1950s when they departed East Africa. They left these laws in place that kind of created the first hint of any sort of stigmatization of same-sex relationships. That was exacerbated even more in the 1980s after the, uh, the uh, fall of Idi Amin when American evangelicals came in and started spreading more of this homophobic rhetoric. And in fact, that anti-gay law that made its way through parliament had been partially drafted by an American pastor named Scott Lively. None of that context was part of any of the histories that I was reading that were quite judgmental of Uganda and their own histories. So for me, it was really important to think about, you know, as, as a person who comes from two cultures with deep histories of colonization, how do we make sure that we acknowledge and continue to carry the ways in which imperialism has impacted our political and our economic and our social structures into the present in, in a way that didn't always feel part of my own education. Um, from that project, you know, I had spent about five years on and off uh, documenting the, the rise and fall of that anti-gay law. Unfortunately, this past year, it was once again brought to parliament and this work is now relevant again. But after several years of doing that work, the organization that was funding a lot of my work, a DC-based organization called the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, they had sent me to an international AIDS conference in Australia and asked me to speak about how when you criminalize sexual minorities, you create a host of public uh, health issues. Namely, HIV rates almost always spike when people don't feel safe going to doctors, to hospitals, getting the medications that they need. Uh, so I wrote a grant application, um, or rather, I read while I was at that AIDS conference a single line in a UN report that mentioned the fact that the group of people in the world with the fastest growing rate of HIV was First Nations people in Canada. I am not a public health expert. I know very little about HIV and the spread and prevalence of HIV. But we all know what the American healthcare system is like. We all, we all know what we have access to and what it can do for us. Canada actually has national health care. You can access doctors and hospitals and medicine for relatively little money, if not no money. And yet there was this massive public health crisis in, in a 10 year period, I believe from 2005 to 2015, the uh, rate of HIV among First Nations people in Canada doubled, which completely outmatches the rate in any other part of the world. You know, in, in the places that we think of as being kind of the centers of HIV prevalence, Latin America, West Africa, the Middle East, all of those places have figured out how to manage and control the spread of HIV. And yet we have this massive public health crisis happening in one of the wealthiest and most stable countries in the world. So I wrote a grant application uh, and decided that I was going to go spend a month driving across Canada from British Columbia to Saskatchewan and the Plains to Ontario and the East Coast, interviewing HIV positive First Nations people. And every single person I talked to, I think on that trip I interviewed 52 people, every single person I talked to mentioned in some capacity their experience in Indian residential schools. And I think now native boarding schools, native residential schools are somewhat common knowledge for Americans and Canadians, but 10 years ago that was very much not the case. In 2014 when I was first making this work, this was not part of our collective understanding of North American history. And I was deeply angry as someone who was educated in the United States, as someone who felt relatively self-aware about my own government and the history of my own country. I was enraged that this was not part of my consciousness or even the collective consciousness in general of non-indigenous people in North America. And you know, for anyone who is perhaps unfamiliar or, or not from North America, in short, starting in the 1870s, the Canadian government created a network of boarding schools that were meant to coercively assimilate 
indigenous Canadians into dominant colonizer culture. And so indigenous children were physically kidnapped from their communities, from their parents, from their families. They were sent to these boarding schools where they were punished if they spoke their own language. They were renamed, they were given Western names, they were not allowed to practice any form of their culture. There was rampant sexual and physical assault. A lot of young women were sterilized. There was medical testing performed on children routinely. And the kicker is that the last one of these schools in Canada closed in 1997. So we think about, again, in the course of our education as Americans, what we think of when we think about conflict between European colonizers and settlers and the indigenous people of this continent, and we think about things that happened over 100 years ago, right? We think about the Indian Wars and smallpox blankets and the Trail of Tears and Wounded Knee. We don't necessarily think about mechanisms and structures that are part of living memory and, and living identity. And, and that was what I was finding. And so I actually ended up going back to the Pulitzer Center and saying, hey, I had the wrong story idea. Could I get some more money and go back and do this again? Thank you, sorry. And ended up returning a year later and decided to produce this series of images that you're seeing here. Um, some of them, I was gonna read some of the texts out loud, but I realized that many of them are, are up uh, on the wall so you can look at them after. But in short, I was feeling more and more the limitations of my medium and the limitations of photojournalism as a tool for talking about memory. And the story so much at its core is about intergenerational trauma and the things that we pass from parent to child without even knowing that we're passing these experiences on and cultural genocide and the loss of pride in your own identity and your own language and your own culture. And I couldn't really photograph that literally anymore. You know, I, as a news photographer, I'm trained to stand in front of something that's happening and take a photo of it, and that's how I tell a story. But the last one of these schools closed in 1997, and I still felt the impacts. I still knew the impacts were there. Every First Nations person I talked to told me the impacts were still there, but I couldn't actually take a photo of it. And so what I ended up deciding to do was I would interview survivors of these boarding schools. I would photograph their portraits, and then based on our conversations, based on our interviews, I would drive to the site where they had attended boarding school and make an image that somehow represented their memories and their experiences. So for Valerie Ewanen, this is actually a broken window in the Muscogan Indian Residential Boarding School where she attended for seven years as a child. Um, most of these boarding school buildings in Canada have now been demolished. A lot of them, when the boarding schools finally closed for good in the 90s, were handed back over to the tribes, and many of them decided to demolish them. These are the sites of horrible memories for their people, uh, but when the, the Muscogan building is, is still standing. Um, and throughout this process, you know, I started this work in Canada, and I think it was probably easier for me to approach this project in Canada where I didn't have to completely confront the legacy of my own government on people in my country. But of course, the second I started to research more, I learned that actually the United States government invented this concept and the first ever Indian boarding school was in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. It was developed by a US Army general um, and that became the model on which all of these other schools in the US, in Canada, in many ways uh, in Australia with the stolen generation, that all of these systems were based. Uh, and so I, I started in Canada and then I ended up spending about four years in the US traveling around the country interviewing indigenous survivors of these boarding schools as well. In the US, the story is a little different. In Canada, it's very consistent. Every school was funded by the government and operated by a church, either the Catholic, the Anglican, or the Presbyterian church. And they worked in concert uh, fairly uh, consistently across the country. In the US, because we have the separation of church and state, that couldn't quite happen. So there were the government public Bureau of Indian Education boarding schools that cropped up on almost every single native reservation across the country. And then there were also largely unregulated private boarding schools, mostly operated by different Christian denominations that also opened on the periphery of reservations around the country. Uh, and these are many of the survivors of those programs. After my first three years working on this project in the United States, I knew that I wanted to capture as diverse a range of experiences as possible, and I found myself in Hawaii in, I believe, May of 2019. Um, and I had known that there were boarding schools in Hawaii and that there were some parallels, but the history is quite different, right? If we think back, again, I'm gonna consistently make fun of American education and the things that we teach children, but if we think about our US history textbooks, we use very coded language to talk about Hawaii and what Hawaii is, right? We say that Hawaii was annexed by the US government, which is really just a fun way to say that the US government violently overthrew the Hawaiian monarchy, right? That, that's actually what happened. 
There's no reason that Hawaii should be part of the United States. It's out in the middle of the South Pacific, but uh, I digress. And so I, I get to Hawaii and I start talking to indigenous Hawaiian educators about their school systems. And I knew to some extent that there was a fairly robust series of educational systems where you could attend from the age of two to 18 entirely in the Hawaiian language, but I didn't know much about the history. And it turns out that those schools have of course always been part of indigenous Hawaiian identity, right? And then of course, when the US government came in and overthrew the Hawaiian monarchy, they said, this is great. We love that you have these boarding schools. They're meant to preserve and protect indigenous Hawaiian culture. How wonderful. You may only teach in English from now on. And there was a hundred year ban on the native Hawaiian language. And so by 1980, there were fewer than 50 native speakers under the age of 18. And this language was classified as critically endangered. It was on the precipice of dying out. And this group of educators, um, some of whom you can see here, got together and said, we have to figure out how to do something about this, right? And so they get together and they go, okay, it is illegal to teach in native Hawaiian to our children, but we can start a daycare and we can just get some grandmothers who happen to be speaking Hawaiian and some little kids who just happen to be listening to, there's no teaching, no teaching is happening. They're just listening to Hawaiian being spoken around them and they opened this daycare and then they started pushing back against legislation and they opened an elementary school and then a middle school and then a high school. And now I believe there are eight entire school systems across the Hawaiian islands where you can, again, you know, attend entirely uh, in the Hawaiian language, uh, full immersion for your entire uh, secondary education. And now there are over 50,000 speakers. So it is still classified as endangered, but it is very robustly coming back. And I was able to spend a little time with this really incredible family who were kind of vanguards early on in deciding that as they grew up, they wanted to raise their children in a Hawaiian language only household. Um, and, and were able to do that and themselves are both Hawaiian language teachers. From this work, uh, and, and also just to note, you know, I think Thinking about the role that our techniques and our visual languages play is incredibly important to me. And so I couldn't just use the same black and white double exposures in the context of the story. It was completely different. It was completely radical and revolutionary to me to see all these ways in which indigenous Hawaiian educators were fighting back, not to say that that hasn't happened in the contiguous 48, but it was happening in a very particular and robust way here. And every single time I went over to a teacher's home, they would pull me into their backyard and start plucking plants and leaves and flowers and hand them to me. And I would press them into my notebooks. And I realized that the, you know, the thing that is at the core of indigenous Hawaiian education is land and is connection to the land. And so when I made these portraits, I decided that cyanotypes, uh, you know, using light sensitive paper and objects, which you then expose to the sun uh, was the best way to honor them and their work. I also try to spend a lot of time thinking about what it means to move away from our traditional models of producing journalism, which is in so many ways a very solitary pursuit, right? I go off on the road for you know 10 months at a time, not really talking to anyone, documenting stories that I choose to and producing work that I choose to edit and produce. And we very often as journalists position ourselves as the experts in these stories and these histories that we share with a wider audience. And to some extent, yes, I've interviewed over 500 survivors of the boarding school system over a period of 10 years. I've read all of the legislation. I am very aware of and connected to, uh, to a lot of the things that are happening, but I'm still not the expert. The people who I have spoken to, the people who lived this experience, they are actually the experts. And so I wanted to think about how I can make the process of production more collaborative as well and not just be in my hands. And so these are a series of collaborations I made with three indigenous artists who each took a series of 10 portraits of uh, survivors I interviewed and read through the interview excerpts and then elaborated on these portraits in their own way. So on the left is uh, an Oneida artist named Mo Thunder. On the right is a Dene artist named Catherine Blackburn. And this is the work of Greg Deal, who's Pyramid Lake Paiute. During all of this time, uh, actually, in, in, in 2021, uh, I moved back to the United States after a nearly nine year stint being based in Europe. Uh, and this coincided with a summer where dozens of Native nations across Canada made discoveries of unmarked and mass graves near boarding school sites. Um, I don't know if folks remember that, but it was just one after the other. The advent of and the accessibility of ground penetrating radar meant that all of these Native communities were discovering that 
in the accounting of students who had died in these boarding schools, a lot of folks had not been accounted for and they were just discovering that uh, their remains had been buried in boarding school sites across the country. Uh, and I was able in the United States to follow the repatriation of seven students who had passed away while at Carlisle uh, from Pennsylvania all the way back to South Dakota on the Rosebud Reservation where a group of youth had fought to have them disinterred and return back to their traditional homelands. And it was an incredibly powerful and moving thing to witness. During all of this time, uh, sorry, I keep thinking of coming up on a different project. Um, as someone who has spent a decade as a non-Indigenous person working in Indigenous communities, I have tried to be hyper aware of the fact that I am an outsider. I, in every project I have worked on, I am an outsider. And so I do not always have the full cultural, linguistic, historical context of the communities that welcome me into their spaces. And I think that also means that I have a responsibility to look at some of the outside responsibilities as well when it comes to the tensions and frustrations that communities face. And one of the things that became more and more stark as I spent more time in Native communities throughout North America was that there was just this very acceptable and normalized level of racism that we have just decided to ignore towards indigenous people in North America. And I thought one of the most signature hallmarks of that was through sports masketry. I'm from Washington, DC. It took me until I was in my late 20s to even think about or question the name of our, you know, no longer thankfully named that football team. Um, but this is a group of students in Cuyahoga Heights, Ohio, uh, carrying that name proudly. Um, and so I started to do some research and I learned that over a thousand high schools across the United States still have, or this is work made in 2018 and many of them have changed since then. But in 2018, more than a thousand high schools across the United States had native themed mascots. And the state with the highest concentration was Ohio. So I went and I spent about two weeks in Ohio interviewing student mascots and athletic directors and school superintendents and principals about their relationship to these identities and these mascots and the communities that they were perhaps sourced from. And interestingly, there wasn't a single community I went to where someone at the school didn't say, oh, well, no one ever said anything. We think this is fine. No one has ever raised anything about it being harmful or problematic. Um, and I'm glad to say that post-2020, almost every single one of these schools has actually changed their mascot. So the conversation has changed. Um, but at the time, it was very surprising to me that being completely upfront and honest about what I was doing, schools were still willing to, to welcome me and to do this work. And for me, it was particularly important to look at young people who were participating in this masketry without intent, without wanting to do harm, without intending to be racist, because when we normalize this behavior from an early age, it becomes really easy to grow up to you know, be this adult super fan of the Cleveland Indians and Chief Wahoo, which at this point had already been retired by the team, but was still being celebrated by this gentleman who owned a bar very close to the stadium and, and continued to put all of these signs up in his bar. During this whole period, this you know, 10 year uh, era where I was working on the signs of your identity and this history of the boarding schools, I was based in London and Paris. And I had really stopped documenting news in a reactionary way. That was very much the start of my career. I would constantly get a call at two in the morning and have to run to document a five alarm fire in the Bronx. And I didn't really wanna do that kind of work anymore. And I didn't really wanna work in a reactive way. But also I lived in Europe from 2012 to 2021 which overlapped with the Syrian civil war and the height of the Syrian refugee crisis. And as someone who is the product, I'm, I'm half Vietnamese, I'm half of Eastern European descent. I am the product of the two largest refugee waves to come to the United States. As I was reading and interacting with the media coverage of Syrians coming to the EU, I was just getting angrier and angrier. We, we know what this rhetoric is. We see it in the United States. We see it everywhere around the world. But this notion that people are coming to steal jobs, that they're coming to take advantage of systems, when truly they are just trying to escape horrific instability and lack of safety for them, for their children. Um, over 5 million Syrians ended up being globally displaced. Many of them ended up in Europe. Many of them believed that Europe could potentially be a safe home for them. And at one point, this port town in France, Calais, became kind of the center point for a huge number of Syrian migrants and other migrants who all wanted to reach the UK. It was sort of the closest uh, port city in France to, to get to, the, uh, to England. So I decided that I was going to travel to France, that I was going to spend a little time. I had no story in mind. I didn't have an assignment. I didn't have an editor. 
but it was really important to me to at least in some way engage with this history and what was unfolding. And so I, I went to Calais. I walk into this refugee camp that was known as the jungle. I have worked in documented refugee camps around the world, and this is by far the worst one I've ever seen in terms of just quality of life and access to services. But I walk in and within 30 seconds make eye contact with this person, uh, Hassam, who is my age. I think at the time we were both 26. And I ended up spending about a week with him. Every single night he would, uh, this is just so you can get a sense of the jungle, French police would just fire tear gas canisters into the tents constantly for no reason. No one was provoking them. It was just a, a very, very horrible place to live. And every night I would go with Hassam as he and this group of friends he had made in the camp would try to make their way onto a train or a ship or the back of a, a cargo truck that was heading to England. And every single night they would fail and we would return home somewhat dejected. But also as this was happening, you know, I speak all of 100 words of Arabic and Hassam speaks about the same number of words of English. And so we were using Google Translate and our cell phones to communicate with each other. And he also starts opening up his phone and, and pulling up images in his camera roll. And you know, the Syrian refugee crisis was kind of notable in that it was the first mass migration of people in world history where almost every single person had a smartphone. It completely changed people's relationship to self-documentation, to communication, to their ability to stay in touch with folks back home and in their new uh, potential homes. And he started showing me all of these selfies that he had taken on this trip. And you know, I was feeling kind of smug about the work that I was making that week. I hadn't really seen personal documentation of what refugees were dealing with, trying to make it across borders, trying to make it to a safe place. I was really proud of myself. I think one of the powers of journalism is that you can take a statistic, you can take an experience that is happening to hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands, or in this case, millions of people, and say, look, this is one man, this is one person, this is what they've gone through, this is what they're experiencing. And I felt really excited that I could do that with him as he went through this really dangerous journey every single night. But then also I realized this was the end of an 11 month voyage. And who was I to come in in the last week and say, I am here to tell your story. I, I am the journalist and I know everything about how to document this. And also, we're both millennials, and for better or for worse, the lingua franca of our generation is the selfie. And it turns out that Hassam had documented this entire journey himself incredibly well. Um, everything, you know, that top middle photo is him being on in a lifeboat in the middle of the Mediterranean, not knowing if he was going to live or die. You know, Hassam and his family are from Raqqa, Syria, which at that point was essentially the capital of ISIS. He had fled in the middle of the night and made it overland across the Syrian-Turkish border. He had managed to get from there to the Turkish coast. He had paid smugglers an exorbitant amount of money to get into one of these little lifeboats that I'm sure we all remember that were constantly overpacked with people and constantly sank. He made it to the Greek island of Kos. He was able to get a ferry to the Greek mainland. He walked across multiple countries. He took trains. My favorite photo of all is he had to connect in a train in Paris to get to Calais. And he figured, well, I'm here. I might as well go to see the Eiffel Tower and take a photo, right? Like, which of, who of us would not do the same thing? And so we ended up co-publishing a piece together of my documentation of him in Calais and what his life looked like, but also his incredible documentation of his own 11th month journey. We added maps. We, you know, we tried to contextualize it as much as possible. And you know, I packed up my gear and went back to London and the piece published. And the next day I got a DM on Instagram from someone who said, hey, I really love your story on Hassam. My name is Majid. I'm Hassam's older brother. I'm in an asylum processing center in Norway. You should come do a story on me. And I went, great, and got on a plane and ended up in this tiny, snowy, freezing mountain town in Norway called Ol. Um, and I got to meet Majid in the middle, who was the life of the party and started dance parties every single night. And he was staying in this, uh, this asylum processing center with about 50 other mostly men from Iraq, from Syria, from Eritrea, from Ethiopia, um, waiting to be told whether or not he would have a residency permit to stay in the country. Um, I also ended up spending time, uh, and you know, the benefit of meeting Majid is that Majid speaks fluent English, and he started to, to tell me everything about the family's history. He and Hassam are two of six adult siblings. They all were forced to flee Syria at the same time. They all are incredibly tight-knit, and their family is so close, but because of circumstance, or because of the language they speak, or because of their education, or because of the job they wanted, every single one of them ended up in a different country. And there was this deep melancholy of they wanted to be together, and they wanted to be close, but they couldn't. 
Um, I next ended up in Denmark, where the youngest sibling, Mohamed Noor, was. And Denmark was very proactively supportive of Syrian refugees, and he was resettled almost immediately. But he was resettled to this tiny coastal town of a few hundred mostly elderly Danes. And he was so lonely and, and had very few friends. Um, his only friend was this other, uh, this Iraqi uh, refugee who had also been resettled to this town. But they were essentially the two non-Danish retirees of the entire village. Um, I started to learn more about how technology was impacting their lives and their journeys. Um, it was fascinating to see the self-documentation they all made of what they sent to each other in the sibling group chat versus what they sent to the whole family group chat with their parents. Their parents got these very smiley, happy photos, even of them on lifeboats in the Mediterranean going, we're safe, we're happy, everything is great. And then the siblings would get the real story of my boat sprung a leak, we almost died, we had to call the Greek Coast Guard. Like We came very close to not making it. And, and it was so interesting to see the way in which they were curating their own stories and their own existence. Um, I spent some time with Basma, who's the only daughter and the oldest sibling, and she ended up in the UK uh, and gave birth to three children and started to think about, you know, what does it mean to raise the next generation when you may never be able to connect them with the place that to you will always be home. I went and spent time with their parents uh, who live in Qatar. They have a slightly different visa situation and they're able to remain in the Gulf. And I got to go through old family photos um, and this is Swad, their mother, uh, touching the portrait of one of her children, Wasim, who's the only one of the six siblings I haven't been able to spend time with. Wasim had gone to college in Ukraine, and when the war broke out, he moved to Odessa to be with his wife, who is Ukrainian. Um, and of course, several years later, he ended up having to flee again. So he's been made a refugee of war twice in a decade. Um, because I think it's always important and always critical to think about joy and happiness, even in the darkest stories, um, Majid, he now is a citizen of Norway. He speaks fluent Norwegian. He works for the Postal Service. He has just like a very perfectly mundane Norwegian life that we love for him. Um, but in the early days of him having residency in the country, he would go back and forth between Norway and Athens because he speaks fluent Arabic and English, and he would volunteer as a translator for the Red Cross, for Doctors Without Borders, for all of these aid organizations, and was hugely helpful. And one day he went to the Parthenon in Athens, and he met this young Tunisian woman who was getting her PhD in microbiology. And they started talking on WhatsApp, and they started flirting a little bit, and they started dating. And then right before the pandemic, I was able to, to be at their wedding. And it was the not all of the family family was able to get together because of different asylum and, and uh, residency permits, but uh, most of them were able to convene for the first time since the start of the war. Um, and it was a really spectacular, beautiful wedding. I always am asked, you know, how, like, how do you handle these hard, dark stories that you seem to just do constantly? And first of all, that's a choice, right? Like I think very often journalists are both terrible at talking about the fact that we constantly expose ourselves to some of the worst things that humanity is capable of. And also we need to not valorize that because we can walk away from those difficult things at any point. But I found myself when I was back in London that I very desperately needed some sort of therapeutic outlet for myself of something that was not you know, here are all of the violent, horrible things that humans have done through world history. Um, so I started this project on off-grid eco-communities in the UK, and it was kind of amazing. I didn't necessarily expect to be able to fit in with this community or to even necessarily be sympathetic with this community, but I just fell in love with all of them, and I spent three years uh, documenting this group who were essentially squatting in uh, this public park in Runnymede, about 30 miles outside of London. Um, that house on the right is where I would stay when I went out there. It was kind of magical and beautiful. Uh, and after three years, sadly, they were shut down because the anniversary of the Magna Carta was coming up and the queen had to be there and a bunch of heads of state had to be there. And so they completely razed that area and evicted them. Um, but that and then a sort of connected story that I worked on in Scotland, which was looking at an island community that had managed to buy their island back from a landowner. Um, I'm not actually showing you any of the impactful images from that story because I mostly just walked around making tiny bouquets of flowers. That was sort of my like therapeutic self-soothing mechanism while I was working on that project. But th this is, you know, th these are the things that I would do in the in-between um, of being on the road working on those longer term projects. Um, I also ended up falling down this very funny rabbit hole of I just completely fell in love with this World War II reenactment community in the UK. 
I was born in Virginia and I grew up in the DC area where Civil War reenactment is still very, very popular. And I, for obvious reasons, never fully understood that. Um, but I moved to the UK and most of these reenactors were reenacting in their father's grandfather's uniforms. There was this deep cultural pride for England's role in World War II. There was this deep desire to continue to sort of uphold, and we can argue that in some way it was also upholding empire, but they were, they were proud of their relationship to global politics in that moment. And so they wanted to continue to reenact in that way. And it was sort of, you know, as someone who always likes to think about the medium and the technique and what that means and why does it matter, I immediately decided that I was going to like nerdy rabbit hole with them and I bought a period 1940s camera and I ended up doing an entire impression of Margaret Burke White that I'm not going to talk about, but I, you know, and I immediately, this group was pretty closed off because I think they were used to journalists kind of classifying them as like nerds and weirdos, which they are. But then I showed up with my period 1940s camera and they went, oh, she gets it. Like she understands our nerdy weirdo thing. Great, she can come and hang out with us. So, you know, that really primed me for a few years later when my friend and collaborator, Dred Scott, uh, who I had been part of a, a cohort with in this exhibition at Open Society Foundations, told me that he was going to be staging a slave rebellion reenactment of the 1811 German coast uprising. And so I said, oh my God, I've always loved New Orleans. I've always loved Louisiana. Can I come and document it? And he said, absolutely, come on down. Um, and I made a lot of these images. These are obviously with a digital camera. Um, and just as you know, a bit of background and context, so the 1811 German coast uprising was the largest slave revol revolt in US history. We talk about and acknowledge slavery regularly enough, but we don't talk about the frequency and the regular occurrence of slave rebellions and slave revolts and how central they were to our own histories. Um, and so Dredd decided that he wanted to stage a complete reenactment of this event. It started in Laplace in St. John the Baptist Parish. Uh, and in the real event, uh, about 50 to 100 unclear enslaved people uh, freed themselves from their plantation. They marched along the Mississippi River for about 20 miles, liberating other enslaved people along the way. They burned down several plantations. They did it in a relatively, I think only two people were killed during their entire march. Um, unfortunately, in the real version of events, they were unsuccessful, right? There was, there was never a successful slave revolt in the United States. And so when Dredd decided that he wanted to reenact this event, he decided that he was going to slightly change the ending and say, what if, what would our history have looked like? What would our relationship to enslavement have been like if we thought about this as an exercise in, in an alternate future and in, in a different possibility? Um, and so this group of about 300 reenactors, some of whom were professional actors, but many of whom were descendants of the actual original uh, enslaved people who participated in that original uprising marched from Laplace all the way to New Orleans and they ended in Congo Square, um, which you can see here, and, and ended with this really beautiful celebration of, of what if this had succeeded? What if we had had an, an alternate ending to this story? And of course, you know, I, I made these images because I was on assignment for Smithsonian Magazine and I needed to make sure that I was nailing those action shots. But as someone who had just spent a bunch of time with uh, those World War II reenactors, um, I wanted to also honor the ethos of reenactment. And of course, the first camera wasn't invented until five years after the 1811 German Coast Uprising. So this camera is not technically period, but we can pretend a little. Um, and so. These are some of those images. And so I just, you know, I think the power of imagination, as, as a journalist, I am someone who deals in reality and the truth, right? That, that is the, the main crux of everything that I am meant to do. Um, and these are the two pieces that are now in the Tulane Library. But I, but I think there is such huge potential for us to imagine the role of futurism, the role of possibility, the role of, of what could be. Thank you so much. I think we have time for questions and folks have mics that we would request that you speak into to ask a question.
All right, I got it. Um, thank you so much. This was just so beautiful. And I, I have a question. Like, I really appreciate everything you were saying about agency. And so I have a question of how do you, how do you marry the, your kind of aesthetic sensibilities as an artist with respecting the agency of the people that you're f photographing in terms of, like, do you pose them? Do you allow them to pick the pose? Like, how do you set it? Like, how do you both, like, get make that connection with them and say, I'm listening to you, I hear you, I want to photograph you, and also set it up so that it's going to be the artistic image that you want it to be? So, you know, my first and primary identity is as journalist. That is the thing that matters to me most. But also, I work in a visual medium. And so artistry and aesthetic is also important. But maybe at the marriage of both is the fact that we can make these processes more collaborative, right? I think everything about my informal early journalism training was that we, we are the agents. We are the people who make the decisions, whether it's aesthetic or editorial or in sequencing or in post-processing, that all of those decisions fall into our hands. I don't know that that's necessarily the best way, right? And so you know, what my students and I talk about all the time is, Journalism and the journalism world has created this series of rules that are meant to apply to everyone. And we cannot apply the same rules to a police chief and a politician that we do to the survivor of a native boarding school, right? Like these are two totally different communities. They have totally different relationships to media. They have completely different relationships to narrative and narrative building. And so for me, you know, I still mostly work in the traditional ways of a journalist in that if I'm documenting live news, I'm not, I'm not asking people to do things for me, I'm not going to interfere. But there is, a, you know, I think a relatively understood social contract of when you take portraits, you, you do pose people, you do tell them like, hey, look this way, like put your feet together, whatever. And I think as much as possible, I want that process to feel like a collaboration, like I am not just the aesthetic or storytelling arbiter of the work that I'm making, but that that person also is playing a role in how I'm telling their story because it's their story, if that answers that question. Hi, Daniela. <clears throat> um, at, you mentioned um, having to do like six to nine stories a day um, and not being able to spend enough time with your subjects and then then you went into stories that took like several years where you got to know like each member of a family. Um, and I was wondering as somebody who like worked professionally in journalism, were there like rules about like your relationship that you just deliberately broke and was there a tension in your work that you had to negotiate to, to be able to do this new kind of work? I broke many of the rules. And what I say to my students is we have an obligation to question the structures and the rules of the industries we work within, but only with full transparency. Full transparency for the people who commission us, full transparency for the people whose lives we're documenting, full transparency for the people who are funding our work, whatever that equation looks like. One of, you know, when I stopped working for newspapers, I very quickly oriented myself towards getting grant funding that allowed me to just kind of go off into the world and make my work without anyone looking over my shoulder, which is how I like to work. I don't like having an editor sending me an email at two in the morning going, have you thought about this? Should you contact this person? Should you go do that? It disrupts my creative process. It's not good for me. So having grant funding both gave me complete freedom to do what I want and also to construct my own moral code. But when I went to editorial clients, when I brought my work to National Geographic or the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, I would say like, hey, I lived in this person's house for two weeks. Hey, I have become the godfather to the child of someone I've documented for a decade, real story. Because that, that is the level of involvement I have in people's lives. And I don't necessarily buy that we have to be these impartial, unbiased third parties that are holding everyone at arm's length because I don't think that's how human relationships work. I can still be an ethical storyteller. I can still tell honest, real stories, even if I become very entangled in someone's life and I become very close to them. And I do that with a great majority of the people I document. And I think that's okay, again, as long as I'm being honest with them and with my clients and with my audience. And so that's what matters most to me. Hi, Danielle. Thank you for this powerful discussion and all the work that you've done. Um, I'm curious if there is a person or event that you're interested in documenting and that you haven't yet. And the reason why I ask that, I, I think part of the 
the curiosity curiosity I have is like there are certain things that you documented and people that you've documented that it was simply because you read something and were inspired by it or some law or some or it was the person itself so is there some person or event that you would like to document next I can't tell if you're baiting me because I think you partially know the answer to this <laughs> uh, but the project that I have had on my mind since before I moved to Louisiana is uh, looking at the products of prison labor um, particularly in the American South I think we don't even understand the degree to which we engage with these objects on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, my father has worked for the federal government for the last 50 plus years. Every piece of furniture he's ever touched in his office has been made by incarcerated labor. Every piece of furniture that was destroyed in the Capitol on January 6th was made by incarcerated labor. Every park bench you've seen in a national park, every denture provided to seniors on Medicaid, there's just like an unending list of things that are manufactured by people in prisons, which if we're being honest, is just an extension of slavery in the United States. So uh, that is my next project that will happen next summer. I got some funding from Tulane to work on that, which I'm really excited about. Uh, and for once, I am, as you may have all surmised, I am not a subtle person with my messaging or the way I tell stories, but for once, I think I'm going to attempt to tell the story in a, in a very quiet, low-key way of look at these things that just sit in our medicine cabinets or in our churches or in our schools and, and the way we just see them and touch them every single day. Um, amazing work, very, very inspiring. Uh, the question that I have for you is on any of the projects that you showed us, did you come to any ethical forks in the road and how did you overcome them? Oh, all the time. I, you know, I think if you're not having ethical forks in the road, you're probably not worried enough about what could be the ethical forks in the road. Um, God, I'm trying to think of specific stories. I mean, I don't know that it's an ethical fork in the road, but truly one of the worst moments of my entire life when I was working on that story in Uganda, I, you know, I, I didn't actually explain what this photo is of, if I can get back to it, but I started out in the community in 2011 when the anti-gay law hadn't quite made its way into parliament yet, but everyone knew that it was coming. Um, I had reached out to this group of activists and there were maybe 18 activists through the entire country and they were the only visible queer people in the entire country. And I had seen fairly robust documentation of them and their work, but it was always of them as individuals in their sort of singular work context. And to me, this was a story about love, right? It was a story about wanting to be with the person you love without having to worry about being thrown in jail or fired from your job or kicked out of your parents' house. And so I asked the activists who felt comfortable can I photograph you with your partner? And I quickly learned that every single one of them was in a relationship with someone who was not out in Uganda. And so I ended up making this series of photos of activists. This is Kasha Nabagasera, who is probably the most prominent lesbian activist in East Africa um, with her partner whose identity is obscured. And so that was how I photographed all of them. I ended up sitting on that work for almost four years because I was genuinely terrified that I could in some way risk the safety of, of the second person in the photo, even though I went to great lengths to protect their identity. Um, but four years later, Christiane Amanpour reached out to me. She wanted to share some of uh, my work in Uganda and I thought maybe this is a good mom moment. So I called up every single one of the activists and said, hey, there's this American journalist on CNN. She wants to share some of the work and talk about what's happening because the law has now been passed and it's kind of a timely time to discuss this. How do you feel? Here's the photo. How do you feel about me making this public and finally getting this out into the world? And every single one of them said, absolutely. And this was a moment in time in Uganda where cell phones, you know, smartphones weren't yet prevalent. Social media wasn't completely universal in the way it is now. And so multiple people said to me, look, I don't want anyone here seeing this, but my parents aren't gonna watch CNN. My parents aren't going to find this. It's, this is a completely divided information space. So absolutely fine, as long as it stays in US media, we're totally good. I end up publishing the images and I get a call the next day from Akram, from one of the people I had photographed, who said, my mom was at her neighbor's house and her neighbor had CNN on and saw the story and she's kicked me out and I don't know what to do. And it, true, I mean, just like, you know, you go to these lengths to try to protect people and then you do the thing you are most scared of. And it, it, genuinely, just the most horrific call I've ever gotten. We managed to find him housing. 
he is okay. He's, I think, even actually mended his relationship with his mother, which is really wonderful. But that, you know, it, sometimes no matter what you do, you still are going to have this incredible impact on people's lives and you have to be prepared to deal with the consequences of that. And I think, I think very often that sense of responsibility is often what has historically been missing from journalism because we so regularly parachute into a place, we form a relationship with a story, a place, a community, we document them, we publish the story, and then we leave. And there's no real accountability. And you know, social media has changed that, the internet has changed that, now we're all findable on the internet. But still, we, you know, once we publish a piece, we aren't often accountable to those communities. We don't go back and say, hey, did you like this? Do you think I portrayed you in an accurate way? Do you think I was ethical in how I moved through your family's homes and your community spaces? And I think we have to systematize a way to, to work more cooperatively and more ethically in communities that are not our own. Thank you. Hi. Um, Okay, great. Uh, Daniela, this was great. Fabulous talk. Um, I guess I want to build off that last question. You know, I've sort of been thinking about media conglomeration and capitalism. You know, we hear these stories all the day about uh, local journalism failing, floundering, and, um, and yet there's still a desire to improve the future of news and to make it a place that is less harmful and, and better for news consumers. And so I guess given your multi-decade experience in photojournalism, I'm sort of curious to know if you found pockets of hope along the way in terms of how editorial practices have evolved, even though you have moved away from um, the, the, you know, corporate news cycle. I just wanted to ask if you found any or could point us towards any pockets of of hope in this age of, you know, capitalism and, you know, surveillance technologies taking over the world. I'm seeing multiple photojournalists in the room just shaking their heads slowly. Uh, I mean, the brutally honest answer is I don't feel a ton of hope right now. I will always believe that ethically made and honestly produced visual media is a vital form of collective storytelling, of collective archive building that we cannot survive without accurate archival images of our lives and our histories. Um, the visual media industry, and I think the journalism industry at large, is on fire right now. Um, you know, my number one client for years, National Geographic, has been obliterated by Disney. Should, am I, should I maybe not be saying these things in a recorded video? Uh, you know, private equity has just completely tanked so many small town newspapers. There are fewer and fewer editorial clients that actually can and do commission freelance photojournalists. It's a pretty dark time. And so I, you know, I know I have a couple students in the room and I, I believe in it and I want you to do it. But also, I, you know, I, I want to be realistic about the fact that it's, it's going to be a hard path and I, we're never going to go away. We're never going to stop being vitally necessary to healthy democratic society. But also we gotta figure some shit out real fast. Like it's, we're, we're in trouble and, and we need to course correct or, you know, and, and there are so many circling threats, you know, like AI being sort of the, the least of them, but I, just, there are all of these different ways in which ethical, smart, important visual media is, is at the crux of human communication. And I'm not, I'm not seeing as many structures of support right now as I would like to see. I'm sorry to be pessimistic about it. Someone please ask a question I can give a happy answer to so we don't end on that. I, uh, I haven't in New Orleans yet, but I should. It's one of my favorite like little happy pastimes. And I literally was just wandering around the Scottish island making tiny bouquets and it was great. I was getting paid to do that for two weeks. It was wonderful. Um, so I'm gonna go back to doing it. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> um, I guess I was just thinking about your response to the last question, and I wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about the activism work that you have been doing for probably at least a decade um, with Women Photograph, which has directly impacted my relationships in the industry. Um, and it, that's why I'm here, because I'm such a big fan of your work, but also of 
of your activism. So I feel like you have more to say maybe about what we can do. I do, and everyone, this is Stacey Kranitz, like an incredible documentary photographer based in Tennessee, like just some of my favorite work being made today. She's a genius, um, and thank you for your question. I, I always believe that there are things we can do. I, I am frustrated by how much money and power is in the hands of people who shouldn't have it and people who don't want good things for our world or for our information systems or for even how we you know, quite literally document our societies. But I always believe these things are worth fighting for. And so you know, just as context, I started a nonprofit called Women Photograph in 2017 in response to the fact that anecdotally, 85% of working news photographers are men. And that's not just a hiring inequality issue, that's, that's a storytelling ethical issue. Because if we are seeing the world through almost exclusively male voices, male lenses, we're missing out on a, a holistic understanding of our own histories. And you know, we can extrapolate that to any demographic and any identity marker, but we need to be, our, our community of journalists needs to be as diverse as the communities we hope to cover, or we will not be telling accurate and nuanced stories. And, you know, I think to, when people ask me for examples, I think to, you know, U.S. journalism coverage of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and a vast majority of the journalists who were deployed to those regions were men, and in conservative religious spaces, that meant they just couldn't document women's lives, right? Even if they had wanted to, even if they had prioritized those stories, they were not going to be allowed into those domestic spaces. They were not going to be allowed to tell specific stories about women. And so they just often don't exist. And so thinking about, you know, I think that that idea of narrative silence that Lindsay mentioned in her introduction is so important to me and we have to fight for it. We have to think about what it means to have a group of documentarians who span race and social uh, and class and religion and, you know, sexual orientation and all of these different markers because if we don't, we will miss stories. We will miss out on narratives. Um, I don't think that actually is addressing your question, but I, but I do believe that's worth fighting for. I do, you know, we're right now going through this strategic planning process with this nonprofit. It is, you know, it's a first and foremost, a hiring database of about 1500 independent women and non-binary visual journalists based in 130 countries. We're also a grant making organization. We run a mentorship program. We have an annual workshop. We collect a lot of data on hiring and publishing statistics within the industry. Um, it has been my agonizing pet project for eight years, and I love it and deeply believe in it. And also, I, I think I feel a lot of the, the pain that the industry is collectively going through right now. So I, I, to answer your question differently, Mira, I, I do have hope. I do. I think we will figure out how to make it through this, but it, it does feel quite grim right now. And I, I don't see what that pathway is, but I'm confident that we'll figure it out eventually. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> um, I'd say it's kind of along the lines of, I mean, everything that you're covering as far as we have these perceptions about groups over time. But, um, you know, we have this idea of documentary work and hard journalism, and then there's fine art and, and, uh, and other categories too. Um, and I really appreciate how you found ways to merge these in ways that make sense. Um, I think my question is just if you want to expand on that at all. And also, did you have any pushback or have you had any maybe um, surprising positive interactions, um, reactions to that? Absolutely. I think that's a great question. Thank you. And, you know, the, the, like you say, the journalism and fine art visual worlds have been so siloed for so long. And generally, you know, according to the basic ethical codes of most media organizations, things like double exposures are not considered ethical, right? Like that is willful manipulation of an image and that is not something that most newspapers are willing to publish. So when I started making that work in 2014, my editors went, that's cool, pass, right? Like they, they weren't interested in touching it. I would send it to my editor at Nat Geo, at the Wall Street Journal, at the New Yorker. The New Yorker actually was the first news outlet to publish them because again, they, they do drift more into that fine art space uh, on a regular basis. But in, May of 2022, Nat Geo published a 20 page feature of that black and white double exposure work. So I think, you know, times are changing, conversations are changing. To some extent, 
you know, I, I always believe in developing a process that is appropriate to the story and that fits the story. But also, a small part of me likes to make those composites and likes to do things with alternative process because my hope is in the constant onslaught of the hundreds of thousands of images that we consume on a daily basis, if I can get you to stop and go, oh, that's weird and different. What's happening here? How, whoa, that, oh, is there a person? No, there's a broken window. Oh, what's going on there? Maybe I have to read the caption now. If I can get you to take a second to care a little bit more beyond the just glazed scrolling, that's worth it for me. That, that gets your attention. I can maybe rant at you a little bit about Western colonization and systems. You know, I, like that, that gives me the in to tell you to, you know, to talk to you about the histories that I care about. So, you know, I, the journalism is the thing that matters most. The truth is the thing that matters most. But I, you know, it, it, it's a visual discipline. And I think we've not allowed, in the context of journalism, we've not allowed the technology that we use for photography to change pretty much as long as it's existed, right? We still have the same one-to-one -one correspondence of, you know, you expose a light onto a piece of paper or film or a sensor, and then you create a photograph. We have a lot of other, like fine art photographers are doing all this cool, weird shit. We should be able to do that as well, as long as we are doing it in service of story and truth and, and narratives that are important to us. So I think that's my take. And early on, it felt like folks didn't agree with me, but now maybe some people are coming around. Thank you all so, so much for coming. It was so lovely to be in conversation. Thank you so much.